the very heart of the Third Reich. Heinrich Himmler, leader of the SS, worked for more than a decade to create a new German order. He foresaw a modern Brotherhood of Knights Templars, dedicated to a quest for a new type of spirituality. He was also seeking a new belief system for Germany, on which a new master race could be founded. Himmler's studies were to take him deep into the strange waters of the occult, and he would do everything in his power to drag the German people with him. Under Himmler's guidance, the SS, the hand-picked, disciplined and fiercely loyal bodyguard of the Führer, were being moulded into the model for an Aryan elite, a mystical order dedicated to the creation of a new world order. The SS were a carefully selected elite, which Himmler hoped would be the stock from which a new and superior breed of human would come, the Superman, a cast of men born to rule the world. This is the castle at Wevelsburg. It was purchased by Himmler on behalf of the SS in 1934. And Himmler's plan was to turn it into a kind of a, a spiritual retreat where he and his 12 top SS officers could come and commune. And the idea was to create a kind of a chivalric order in the same way as uh, the Arthurian legends. Behind me here in the, in the North Tower, which you can see over my left shoulder, is the place where they, they planned to create a crypt. Uh, which still exists today. But inside here you'll find uh, two very interesting rooms which really illustrate the the lunacy, not just of uh, Karl Maria Villigut, who was Himmler's guru, but also the whole of the, the National Socialist Movement, because uh, in this uh, area, there are uh, two rooms, one of which is a crypt, uh, which was intended to be the, the heart of the National Socialist, and the other is a meeting room where Himmler and his top 12 SS officers intended to come and create a kind of pseudo Arthurian setup where they would um, conduct themselves around the, the essentially a round table in the same way that the um, uh, the Arthurian knights are supposed to have done. Um, as you can see, we're standing here in the courtyard uh, of the castle at Wevelsburg. It's a fairly small area, but it didn't have to be particularly large because this was for the elite. Himmler hoped to bring his top 12 senior officers to Wevelsburg where they would learn and where they would begin to form uh, this pseudo-Arthurian inner circle. It's interesting to, to note that both Hitler and Himmler were bitterly opposed to the Freemasons, but under the influence of Karl Maria Villigut, Himmler was only too ready to copy the Freemasons and to create his own uh, mythology and his own pseudo-religious rituals which were performed here at Wevelsburg. It's very indicative of the kind of thinking that underpinned not just his philosophy, but the whole of the, the National Socialist philosophy, where they believed that um, 
uh, one could reach back into the past and into the German myths and to bring those myths back into the 20th century. The origins of the SS did not begin with the personal visions of Himmler or his Führer. The roots of the SS went deeper even than those of National Socialism itself. Amongst the aristocratic and educated classes, in the first decade of the 20th century, the overriding mood was one of nostalgia. There was a powerful yearning for a vanished past, a past believed to be more orderly, more harmonious and more spiritual, and Heinrich Himmler was no exception. This was the Völkisch movement, a deeply conservative trend which tended towards Lebensreform, or life reform. The Völkisch movement yearned for the restoration of a more natural way of living. Tens of thousands of German youth joined the Wandervögel, the Birds of Passage. Its members shared a mystical love of the German countryside and revered German folklore and rituals. The Völkisch movement rejected conventional science and medicine as a part of the Industrial Revolution and instead embraced vegetarianism and herbal healing. Fringe activities such as sun worship, nudism, communal living and meditation became fashionable pursuits. In every major city, folkish cults devoted to spiritualism, astrology, magic and the occult flourished. At the heart of each of them were to be found the disciples of life reform. One of the most dedicated of these disciples was the young Heinrich Himmler. Of all the esoteric doctrines favoured by the Völkisch movement, none were more influential than those preached by the Russian adventurous and self-proclaimed telepath and spiritualist, Madame Helena Blavatsky. In 1888, Blavatsky claimed to have travelled to Tibet and there to have been initiated into the secrets of spiritual masters she called the Hidden Elect. This was to prove a key doctrine in the belief system of the occultists. The hidden elect, or the Great White Brotherhood, were believed to be ordinary humans who, by initiation and self-denial, had risen to become adepts, who were supposed to have gained powers and knowledge beyond the reach of ordinary mortals. Madame Blavatsky did not claim to be an adept in her own right, but she did claim constant telepathic communication with her hidden masters. Blavatsky claimed they had revealed to her, their chosen one, the occult history of the human race. Blavatsky's claims spread far and wide. In Britain, Alastair Crowley, a magician of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, claimed in 1909 to have crossed the abyss and returned as an adept. According to Madame Blavatsky, each round of the cosmic cycle has associated with it seven root races. The first root race to evolve on Earth she called the astral race. It was a race of pure spirit, the highest form of existence. The second she called the Hyperborean race. Its home was a now vanished continent in the Northern Ocean. The third race was the Lemurians, Blavatsky was clear about the reasons for the fall of the Lemurian race. It had interbred with animals. The fourth race in the history revealed to Blavatsky is Atlantis. The Atlanteans possessed psychic powers and had constructed giant cities using an energy source of mysterious origins. The Atlanteans were destroyed in a great flood. The fifth root race Blavatsky sees as the race of hope the race that had once founded the culture of ancient Greece and would soon return man to the pinnacle of spirituality. This race she called the Aryans. By 1914, Blavatsky's mystical doctrine of the destiny of Aryan man had spread throughout Germany and Austria. It was widely embraced by the Völkisch fringe and both Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Hitler were caught in its spell. 
Himmler was particularly susceptible to occult practices and believed in psychic and paranormal phenomena including reincarnation, spiritualism and astrology. Himmler genuinely believed in the prophetic powers of horoscopes and relied upon his own horoscope which he cast frequently. One event that Himmler did not foresee was the outbreak of the Great War. Hitler has often said that the Great War was the defining experience of his life. It was the most satisfying and fulfilling time for him. Himmler would love to have had that experience, but he was born just a fraction too late. And although he was able to join the army in 1917, uh, he was still undergoing training when the war came to an end. So Himmler lacked that one piece of shared experience that so many members of the Nazi party had and that they'd been in the Great War and experienced conflict at first hand. In the ranks of the German and Austrian armies fighting the Great War, there was a widespread belief that the predictions of the Völkisch Fringe would be advanced by the unification of German-speaking peoples and the creation of a Germanic Empire, which would result from a successful war. To many soldiers, the teachings of Austrian clairvoyant Guido von Liszt were an inspiration. Von Liszt built on Blavatsky and added the idea that in the Germans, more than in any other people, ran the blood of the mythical race of the Aryans. To Liszt, the Great War was proof that the modern world, with its new-found materialism and its new-fangled democracy, was destroying itself. Nonetheless, Liszt proclaimed that out of war and destruction would come the victory of the German cause and the beginning of an Aryan millennium. In support of his ideas, Von Liszt revived the prayer of the 16th century philosopher and heretic, Giordano Bruno. O Jove, let the Germans realize their own strength, and they shall not be men, but gods. Like Alistair Crowley and Blavatsky, von Liszt's inner thoughts led him to believe in the existence of a hidden elect. Von Liszt added his own touch to the mix with his accounts of trance visions, in which ancient German tribes had revealed to him an elite class of priest rulers, the Armanenschaft. According to von Liszt, the role of the Armanenschaft was to preserve the occult knowledge of the Aryan ancestors of the modern day German nation. Von Liszt claimed that the imposition of Christianity on the Teutonic tribes and the persecution of the followers of the old religion forced the Armen to continue its traditions in secret. Their law had lived on and the rituals and symbols of a network of secret societies. The store of knowledge had been preserved down the centuries by the Freemasons, Rosicrucians and chivalrous orders such as the Knights Templar. So great was von Liszt's influence among German and German-Austrian nationalists that in the pre-war years, many army officers had joined the secret occultist organization inspired by his teachings. The Germanenschaft, or German Order, founded in May 1912, had lodges in ten German cities. The government of the order was led by a secret 12-man council of initiates. The future German Empire would, according to Liszt, be governed by a similar council of initiates, a new Armanenschaft. Heinrich Himmler bought into all of Liszt's visions, and he would ensure that in the design of the future SS, Liszt's Armanist assembly would not be forgotten. 
One day soon, Himmler was to deliver a new spiritual home for the SS. This is a very unusual feature indeed, uh, because here in Germany, understandably, they've gone to great lengths to remove any possible vestiges uh, of the Third Reich era. But above the, the small sentry post here, uh, there is a, a stone plaque which was added in the 30s. Uh, and you can see the unmistakable outline of the two SS runes, uh, which were the symbol of the SS. Uh, it's very unusual to find any remaining traces, but without doubt, there they were, uh, and there they are today, which is, uh, is quite remarkable, really. Liszt's prediction that the Great War would see the victory of Imperial Germany over its democratic and degenerate enemies was to prove false. By 1918, the German economy was in ruins and the Kaiser's armies were crumbling. To the men at the front, the failure of the Imperial War Machine was inexplicable. Early in 1918, Germany had won several major battles and in 1917, the Russian enemy had totally collapsed. Theories of a conspiracy abounded. Many believed Germany had been betrayed from within. blame was placed squarely on the shoulders of the traditional targets of the German nationalist movements, capitalists, democrats and Jews. The widely held conspiracy theory was shared by many soldiers. Their joint belief was that the valiant German army had received a Dolchstoss, a stab in the back. Germany had become a democratic republic. And to the followers of von Liszt, all that was valuable seemed irretrievably lost. The situation deteriorated when a government of unknown politicians had accepted the humiliating terms of the Versailles Treaty. Worst of all, the Kaiser and the German princes had abdicated the throne. The abdication of the Kaiser was a stunning blow to Himmler and his fellow occultists of the German order. Liszt had taught that the aristocracy of Germany had been founded in an ancient time by the Amanenschaft themselves. In the aristocracy was to be found the purest of Aryan blood and with it the strongest remaining traces of the Aryan psychic powers. In the aftermath of the Great War, faced with the twin threat of democracy and socialism, traditionalists desperately clung to von Liszt's mystical belief in the German nobility. But side by side with the teachings of von Liszt, a new form of social Darwinism was also being embraced. The heady mix of the arcane and the scientific would become enmeshed together in a new pseudoscience known as eugenics, which was to form the cornerstone of the Nazi ideology. Moral belief in the equality of man was dismissed as simply unscientific. The new slogan was expressed as simply the survival of the fittest. And in Himmler's eyes, the Aryan race was undoubtedly the fittest. By 1918, eugenics had become so influential that under the new name of racial hygiene, universities, departments and institutes were established devoted to the new science. By the 1920s, 
theories underpinning eugenics had won widespread support amongst the German medical establishment. It also had a profound effect on the doctrines of German occultists. In 1919, von Liszt, the foremost prophet of the Aryan millennium, died in Berlin at the age of 70. His place as Germany's leading mystic and visionary was taken by Jörg Lanz. Lanz, an existential monk and respected biblical scholar, was to introduce new twists, which were to have a profound effect on the development of Nazi ideology and on the structure and ritual of the future SS. Lanz had blended the Aryan occultism of von Liszt and the principles of the science of eugenics into what he called his new doctrine, theozoology. Theozoology was an occult religion based on race. Inspired by Blavatsky's mystical history of racial evolution, Lance claimed that the decline of the Aryan race happened because they had committed bestiality with a subhuman species. The result was the creation of many mixed races, races whose very existence threatened the rightful dominance of the Aryans. Like von Liszt, Lance believed that the early Aryans possessed the power of telepathy, but interbreeding with racial inferiors had led to the loss of their paranormal abilities. The teachings of Jörg Lanz were propagated throughout Germany and Austria by his own journal, Ostara, founded in 1905. Lanz claimed that over 100,000 copies of Ostara were sold each year. In the pages of Ostara and in a series of widely read essays, Lance developed a terrifying prescription for the purification of the Germanic race. He proposed polygamy to increase the birth rate of the racially purist. Eugenic convents were to be established in which chosen women he called brood mothers would produce children for the racially pure males. On the other hand, the racially impure and the physically or mentally unfit were to be sterilized. Other races, such as the Jews, who were deemed to be irretrievably inferior, were to be deported to Madagascar or used as slave labor. It is sobering to realize that under the Third Reich, all of Lance's proposals would be given the most serious consideration, and some were actually put into practice. Such as the introduction of a massive compulsory sterilization campaign aimed at those deemed to be physically, mentally or racially inferior. Widespread euthanasia for those with congenital mental problems. The deportation of German Jews to Madagascar was discussed in the highest ranks of the Nazi party. And the SS planned for the official introduction of polygamy and actually founded its own SS breeding program. To Lance and to Himmler, the legends of the Knights of the Holy Grail were more than the products of the medieval imagination. The search for the Grail, as defined by Lance in the 20th century, was the search for racial purity. Already Himmler had identified the figure of German history who was to become his idol and his inspiration. King Heinrich I, German King of the Saxons, had in the 10th century fought and conquered the Slavic tribes of the East. So great would Himmler's devotion to the king become that he would make an annual pilgrimage to Heinrich's tomb and believed himself the reincarnation of the king and the recipient of psychic messages from the spirit of the dead ruler. Himmler believed that his divine mission was to complete the work of the King Heinrich. He planned to create from the SS a knightly order which would rule the coming Aryan Empire. In 1907, Lance formed an occult society dedicated to a new crusade for racial purity. He called it the Order of the New Templars. In the castle of Burg Werfenstein in Upper Austria, Lance founded the order's first headquarters. Other order priories soon followed. The occult rituals of the new Templars were based on Lance's monastic experiences, 
and his own specially composed psalms, prayers and readings. The aims of the order were explicit, to harmonize science, art and ethics into an occult religion devoted to the purification of the Aryan race in all countries of the world. For Lance, the new Templars were the beginning of a new order. No longer will parliaments determine the fate of people, Lance proclaimed. In their place would rule wise priest kings and leaders of chivalrous and spiritual secret orders. All of this was music to the ears of Heinrich Himmler, who founded his own version of Burg Werfenstein. come here to Dachau, which is the very heart of darkness. This is the place which is really very much the brainchild of Heinrich Himmler. The idea behind a place like this was already developing in his mind because Hitler was no sooner in power than Dachau was under construction. It's almost incomprehensible that such a place like this could exist, but Hitler and Himmler were master politicians and they had a, a very clear idea of what they wanted to achieve in German society. The transformation of the SS from the elite guard of the Führer to the mystical order it eventually became was essentially the work of Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was appointed head of the SS in January 1929. The most enigmatic of all Nazi leaders, Himmler was an absolutely devoted follower of the Aryan occultism of Blavatsky, von Liszt and Lance. He too dreamt of a Germanic empire ruled by an Aryan elite. The collection of individuals which Himmler brought together to form the SS were an unsightly and bullying bunch. The, the one exception to the, to the rule appeared to be Reinhard Heydrich. Heydrich became Himmler's dedicated and, and loyal subordinate. And he was an extremely capable individual who again was a, a skillful and very Machiavellian politician. And between Heydrich and Himmler, they formed a very formidable team indeed. Himmler was of an extremely nervous disposition and it manifested itself in a series of stomach troubles which constantly plagued him throughout his career. Uh, Any time where he got nervous or there was tension, his stomach troubles would surface and often Himmler would be forced to take to his bed uh, in extreme agony. In addition to being a Reichsfuhrer of the SS, Himmler of course was also the head of police throughout Germany, so there were a great deal of things on his plate and without some very efficient subordinates, Himmler could never have managed the workload. From a young age, Himmler had been an eager convert to the folkish concept of life reform, 
The land, he believed, was the origin of all that is good, and that cities were the source of all that is unhealthy, corrupt, and immoral. The yeoman on his own acre, wrote Himmler, is the background of the German people's strength and character. Himmler had long been associated with the Artemann League, a nationalist and anti-Slavic movement of city youth committed to life on the land and the expansion of German farming into the east. The oath to the Artemann League was sworn by blood and soil. In the Artemann League, Himmler met the man who was to transform the oath by blood and soil into a central doctrine of the SS. To Walter Dara, an ex-official in the Prussian Ministry of Agriculture, the relationship between German blood and German soil was a source of mystical power. For men like Himmler and Dara, questions of agriculture were not questions of economics, but of race and destiny. Heinrich Himmler was now free to put into effect the next phase of his plan for the SS. The creation of a mystical order of Teutonic Knights, an order which was to dominate the coming Aryan millennium. Behind me at the bottom of the steep flight of stairs here, we can see the logical conclusion of Himmler's war with the Catholic Church. This was an attempt to create a new religion for the Third Reich. And it's quite a bizarre undertaking when you consider what was actually supposed to happen here. This place looks innocuous, but uh, the whole history of this is um, redolent of uh, Heinrich Himmler and his ideas. It looks ancient, but it was actually constructed in the 30s, uh, in 1934, by volunteers. And it was here uh, at the Thingplatz that the spiritual heart of uh, Himmler's plans was to take place. Himmler and Karl Maria Villegut were bitter opponents of the Catholic Church and this was the beginning of their own attempt to create a religion which would rival the church they despised so much. They decided to come here to the Heiligerberg, just overlooking Heidelberg, the holy mountain. And it was here that they built the first of the, the Thingplatz. Now the Thingplatz were designed to replace the Christian churches. And in Himmler's warped mind, he could see a network of these places all over Germany where people would flock to celebrate a religion which was based on a return to nature and the the turning of the seasons. There was no scriptural basis, there was only a vague set of beliefs that the summer solstice should be celebrated, uh, as should the spring solstice, and of course Yule, which was the name that they used to replace Christmas. The whole um, spiritual aspect of the Third Reich was very much concerned with uh, forests and nature. So this is the kind of place that they hoped would be a forerunner to a religion which would spread throughout Germany and the Third Reich. It never was particularly popular, understandably, as a religion because the whole concept is false. So it didn't really find public uh, approbation for what they were trying to do.
Himmler's strategy for the SS was not one of rapid expansion, but instead one of careful and systematic selection. In 1930, Himmler had won a valuable concession from Hitler. The SS would be allowed to recruit from the ranks of the SA. Himmler had begun to put into practice his theories of breeding. We went about it like a nursery gardener trying to reproduce a good old strain that has been adulterated and debased. I started with a minimum height requirement. I knew that men of a certain height must somewhere possess the blood I desired. On December the 31st, 1931, Himmler established the SS Race and Resettlement Bureau. It was to be headed by his old friend, Walter Dara. Dara was awarded the rank of Honorary SS General. The task of the Race and Resettlement Bureau was to prepare for the future colonization of the East by pure-blooded Germans. It was also instructed to conduct research into racial ancestry, biological selection and the history of the Aryans. Its staff of leading academics and medical men were ordered by Himmler to create stricter requirements for SS entry. Bureau physicians were to assess the degree of racial purity of each applicant. By physical examination, only those considered pure or predominantly Nordic were suitable candidates for membership. The examiners were instructed to take into account the attitude and bearing of the candidate. In his attitude to discipline, the man should not behave like an underling. His gait, his hands, everything should correspond to the idea we have set ourselves. To Himmler, selection was only the first step in his plan to reclaim the Aryan blood latent in the German people. The second stage was control of SS breeding. The Race and Resettlement Bureau was charged with the task of racially vetting SS marriages. Prospective brides of SS men were required to prove the purity of their Aryan blood back to the year 1750. The Bureau was to be responsible for examining almost 2,000 SS marriage applications every month. It was the beginning of the largest and most terrifying eugenics experiment in human history. Himmler was so confident of the success of his plans that he predicted in 120 years the entire German people would once more be pure-blooded Aryans. Himmler knew that the realization of his Aryan vision was dependent on, above all, the SS becoming the most powerful organization in the Nazi party and in the German state. Already Hitler had given the SS the role of carrying out police and intelligence duties in the party, and Himmler was quick to seize this opportunity to expand his power to the German police force, which he wrested from Hermann Goering. In 1931, Himmler recruited a 33-year-old ex-naval officer, Reinhard Heydrich, to found an SS security service. The establishment of the SD was to be the first stage in Himmler's creation of an SS state within a state. By the summer of 1934, Himmler had won total independence for his SS elite. His eugenics program was established and he had begun the process of winning control of all German police and security service. With Hitler's blessing, he had created the Leibstandarte, which would eventually form the nucleus of an SS army. Under Himmler, the Waffen-SS was expanded rapidly. We can see again his mastery of uh, bureaucracy, that Himmler was able, as well as combining his role as uh, head of police, to be able to run the, the Waffen-SS as effectively as it was. The Waffen-SS is often overrated as a field force, but there were undoubtedly a number of actions where the Wehrmacht troops were very pleased to have the SS fighting alongside them.
A number of um, Waffen SS formations fought very well indeed in the field, particularly in the Normandy campaign and, and in Russia. But there were also examples of unrivaled brutality. The Das Reich division disgraced themselves in France, as did the, the Totenkopf division. So um, it's, it's often overrated as a military force, the Waffen SS. Um, its successes were relatively few in number and ultimately there was nothing they could do to stave off the military defeat. Of all the prophecies made by Lance, one would become Himmler's obsession. On astrological grounds, Lance foretold the invasion of Europe from the east. Himmler had come to believe that it was the destiny of the SS to repel the coming assault. The great battles he foresaw would be a prelude to the final victory of the Aryans. But Himmler's Camelot was never to be completed as the grim reality of World War II crowded in on Himmler's world. This is the um, Palace of Justice here in Nuremberg and it was here on the 20th of November 1945 that the trial of 21 of the leading representatives of the National Socialist regime began. It took place in courtroom number 600, uh, which is in the building behind me. Today, uh, it's still used as a courtroom, so access is limited, but it's generally possible to go and visit the spot uh, where the trials actually took place. Among the distinguished visitors, Byshinsky, Deputy Foreign Minister of the USSR, and Goshenin, Soviet Prosecutor General. The criminals are accused of general conspiracy. This is courtroom 600. This is where the 
Nuremberg trials took place, the 21 most senior Nazis were brought here to face the music. Hermann Goering, Hitler's close friend, formerly known as the second man in the Reich. Goering initially had a great deal of influence over the defendants and famously said, you can kiss my hairy ass. But over the course of the proceedings, even Goering was worn down and he too committed suicide shortly before the execution that had been ordered. Also on trial were leading figures such as Keitel and Jodl, Hitler's military advisors, and both of them were sentenced to death. One man who escaped the death sentence was the architect for much of what we can see in present-day Nuremberg, Albert Speer. He developed the buildings of the Zeppelin Tribune. Speer was sentenced to life imprisonment, but uh, was eventually released. Um, also on trial was the notorious Julius Streicher. Streicher was the publisher of the infamous Der Sturmer. Himmler, of course, lacked the courage to face up to the monstrosity of his crimes and committed suicide near Hamburg. 